said that. Oh, my <laughs> yeah. There was something Spanish in there. Well, welcome to the Talking Gourds Poetry Series here at the Wilkinson Library, the um, Telluride Writers Guild, Norwood Writers Guild, Wilkinson Library, uh, Between the Covers Bookstore, uh, Telluride TV. Who are our other sponsors? Right I now? think you named everyone. Almost everybody. Well, we're really honored to have our dear friend, Wendy Vidaluk, here to uh, talk to us a bit about writing. And maybe things beyond writing, too. Well, she does more than just write, which is maybe why we're so impressed with Wendy. Uh, not only does she publish and, and uh, perform, but she also is a fine artist and, and does a lot of uh, classes and workshops and things. And Maybe you could talk to us a little bit, Wendy, about the creative impulse that makes you do more than just poetry. Is it an impulse or an obsession? <laughs> <laughs> that was your first email that I remember was obsession, yeah. That used oh. to be my name. That, that was your That's still tag. mine. That will always be my middle name. <laughs> Wendy yeah. Obsession. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, creative impulse. Well, <clears throat> my um, I would say that my real um, impulse is the writing, and the rest is, as Joni would say, um, crop rotation. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So I know a big part of what's um, interested you is your reading of other poets, and that's a large part of what inspires you. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the voices that oh, the voices. Really Well, I think that we all have stories about how when we were young, somebody reached from beyond the grave and touched us. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's been a big influence, is the voices that you know sort of cut through all the white noise and said, mm. or something about the rhythm of them. Um, really spoke to me, mm -hmm. and I said, boy, I want to communicate that way, too. Um, there, there is something about poetry that does that, which is transcends time and space, <clears throat> so that you can be looking at something that appears very static, you know, the written word, and be moved by a soul that's still with us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting to me that you mentioned that it's beyond the words themselves, it's the rhythm of the words, mm -hmm. which suggests to me that you're either hearing them actually out loud or hearing them aloud as you read them. Yeah, or I, just, both. I just read the other day that we do a poem a disservice if we read it silently. <laughs> I mean, if we start to read a poem and then about two or three lines in we start mouthing it and then we start speaking it yeah, and then uh, we start singing it, then we know we've caught that rhythm. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's a big part of your writing too. Yeah, I do think poetry is song. Uh, <laughs> and your poems sing. I hope your poems so. sing. Yeah. They do. You like to use rhyme and meter, and, but you don't do it strictly. You're not. I've called you a neo formalist, and you've rebelled many yes. times because you don't really stick to the standard rhymes and meters. Yeah. So what's that all about? Well, I, I think that the the, the, uh, the iambic rhythm and the anapestic rhythms and the trochaic rhythms, which are really evident in the English language. Um, are there to be played with, not to just ride along, but to mm -hmm. also play with them. With them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I play a little loose with the meters, <laughs> like, like we should. Well, th this was a big deal for Hopkins, right? I mean, that was his thing we about were just talking rhythm. about Hopkins the other night. Yes, yeah. Um, he had a very specific rhythm. In fact, made notations about how he wanted, you sure. know, the stresses in in there to, to go because because we had trained our ears to read a certain way, yeah. and he wanted to break us out of that and see that within that basic heartbeat, there are many variations. Right. You, know. you know, it's interesting because uh, in terms of Anglo-Saxon speech, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, an accent kind of rhythm, and if you go back to the uh, uh, Beowulf or something, there's four beats to a line, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not the quantitative meter that we, the English people, took from the Roman, which was really about vowel length. It wasn't really about mm -hmm. accent. Right. And we've translated that to accent. Mm -hmm. So how do you make that marriage between the Anglo-Saxon beat and the, um, the Roman uh, British kind of uh, uh, steps? Mm -hmm. Boy, I think by reading a lot of Eastern stuff, too, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there's something that connects all of those things that goes beyond 
um, the specific languages because some languages are com comprised of duration of vowels and others do have a, a this. Um, and it's very, I mean, it's very, very difficult um, to think beyond those rhythms. I mean, the Sufis were doing it too. They had found a rhythm within their language that was suited to their language. But there are bridges between them all, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So let's pretend Art just called you a neoformalist. <laughs> 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 uh oh, I'm going to get hit. <laughs> <laughs> and let's hear what you have to say to him. I mean, why not? Um, well, most. I think I'd, I really rebel against any kind of label. Oh, good. It's not just <laughs> that one. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's a false um, dichotomy. I mean, I feel that poetry has set itself up as, as these two major camps of formal verse and free verse. And um, I have found that in between, I mean, I think this way of politics, too, that there's something beautiful going on in between there, and you just keep pushing further away from each other. And, so I don't understand why we have to be one or the other. Why the poem can't dictate, you know, what kind of rhythm or what kind of um, what kind of thing it wants to sort of emerge as. You know, Lou Welsh was a big fan of uh, of, of conversational English, and mm -hmm. so um, he kind of understood that in uh, the way the American language uses um, uh, English, uh, a, a, you know, a language that came from the British Isles in this country, we tend to use it in almost a staccato bursts of um, uh, several beats in a row and then lots of, you know, hardly any beat and then beats. So it's not necessarily the pulse of a regular rhythm, mm -hmm. it's a sort of more uh, mixed pulse. Right. Does that play into some of what you do? Yeah, yeah, and I find too that the more I the more I um, immerse myself in Spanish, that the more... Mm -hmm. well, I've always been very big on vowels. And you talk about the Beowulf, mm -hmm. if you read even just a few pages of it, mm -hmm. then your own writing will begin to change <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> you get much more masculine and hard-hitting, and, mm -hmm. um, and the Romance languages will tend to be you know, softer and more rhythmic and circular, and, which I tend towards. Well, there is that cussive sound mm -hmm. of the consonants right. in, the, in the Germanic languages that mm -hmm. kind of stands out, whereas the Romance languages tend to be more vowel mm -hmm. movements, mm -hmm. you know, kind of fluid. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. aware are you of that when, you, when you're writing? Um, is it intuitive? Only, only mostly? after, I think. I think it is. I mean, I think that we have our natural... Um, I think that as I've gotten older, I've just become softer. You know, that mm -hmm. the early work was probably full of those kinds of rhythms. and. Um, and now I'm much more interested in the, um, the vowels than, um, much more interested in rounded corners than sharp edges. <laughs> and those come from the vowels. Mm -hmm. your, 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 so the, the lyric that you do, is, and, and, and your poetry is very lyrical, it, it's, it always stands out. But what really takes it to the new level for me is that there's a deep message always buried in those lovely lyrics that play. So the facile surface that you kind of see is, is sometimes almost jingly and, and happy, but sometimes it's counterpointed with very deep message and strong emotion, and y you end up playing with words that take us really into deep places. Thank you. What's that about? <laughs> Are you a deep person? <laughs> it's not just playful. No. and. You know, I mean, look at Cummings. I mean, he was not just playful. <laughs> um, I think that's, I mean, it's sort of like um, laughter. You know, if you can first see the clarity of something or the laughter of something, then it opens us up to um, wider ramifications, and you can say a lot more, um, I think. I don't know. I think. I can just say that, you know, I know I've called Wendy several times weeping and, and she'll kind of laugh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Not in a like, no. <laughs> not to be mean, right? Not in a, that kind of way, but more like a, oh, isn't this sweet? You just found yourself here. <laughs> 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 yes. You know, and then she'll deliver something, you know, that, that you know, is, is um, has that more wisdom piece to it, but it begins with a laugh. I think so. I think that is the key. I mean, w the, I think we're all at our best when we're laughing at ourselves. You yeah. know, when we're just, a, a, if not belly laughing, then at least chuckling yeah. underneath <laughs> the <laughs> agony. <laughs> of well, it, it is all. easier to laugh at yourself when you call someone weeping and they laugh. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yes. 
So poetry often tends to be a solitary exercise that people do, and I, mean, I know you have a lot of alone time in your life. But you also have a family, and you like to hang out with gangs of poetry, gangs of the cosmos. You have uh, yeah. lots of friends who kind of feed your poetry. Um, what's that balance? Um, well, it's, it's, I've always had tribes, circles of tribes, like kind of like Venn diagrams. So they <laughs> overlap, and, and I do think that, I think you were the one who said to me once that we tend to gather in groups of four to seven, that these were sort of the clans, you know, and, um, and then they grow out from there in circular, in circular sort of formations. Um, but, um, but I do think talking poetry and reading poetry is really a, a marvelous thing for writers. <laughs> it's the first thing I tell budding writers is find community, find always, community. always find your poets, mm -hmm. you find your people, you'll feel a little better about yourself <laughs> because it is a solitary thing. Um, visual artists and musicians are much better at getting out there and being around each other and doing their art together. Mm. Musicians obviously mm -hmm. have to. Visual artists can paint together. We can get together and paint together. Writers don't generally get together and write. We get together and hang out, but, right. but unless we're at a workshop or a conference or something like that, we're not writing. So what do you get from a, a community, a gang? Uh, well, it depends on which one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> the one that you're referring to. <laughs> um, uh, that laugh that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. that because because writing is so insular and because we can take ourselves so seriously that that we can help each other just sort of chuckle through and um, I think that's really the key to, to family and friends is keeping that laugh. Mm -hmm. A.R. Ammons, had, I listened to an interview with him a while back and he said in his interview that people would ask him, you know, about being a poet and they would want to know you know, they were coming to him for encouragement, like, yes, be a poet. Mm -hmm. And he would say to them, <clears throat> why would you do that? Yeah, right. <laughs> Sit alone all day, mm -hmm. picking away at your own liver. <laughs> 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 he says, you know, why not play football or piano or have friends, have a hobby? He says, but if you must write, yeah. then I say, write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it. And you, then that's what you do. Yeah. yeah. There's a great story about um, Theodore Rethke, or Rethke. I always say Rethke, and then someone corrects me. Um, but he was a really wonderful teacher. Everybody who um, uh, was in his classes would say, well, he was a big bear of a guy. And uh, tell, his students tell a story of him um, being in the classroom, you know, delivering a lecture, and then walking over to the window and saying, it is spring. I must write, and he just opens the window and climbs through. It's a big. That's a good lesson. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, who are some of the people that have, uh, you know, really inspired you in, in writing? Like, who are you reading um, these days? Well, I'm rereading a lot of what I read when I was young. Um, Kipling and um, Don't Make Political Judgments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kipling, um, Mother Goose, um, The Brothers Grimm, um, Sendak, um, C.S. Lewis. Um, because I've been writing children's poems. So. Mm. As far as our culture goes, those are all common themes. You know, one of the things that uh, about tribal indigenous peoples is that they often had a common. Uh, wealth, of myth, and story, yeah. and uh, we are so diverse. We don't always have that. But yeah. when you go back to the children myths, mm -hmm. we do. We all yeah. share those things, mm -hmm. don't yeah. we? Yeah, we do. Um, we do, and I think it goes back to my desire for you know the deceptively simple. You know, that <laughs> because children's the best children's literature and poetry and songs are so mm -hmm. simple mm -hmm. that we can all learn them, um, and they seem like it's right there. And then you go a little further, and there's plenty going on underneath. And I think about Yeats with you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The stolen child. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he spoke to me really young, too. Um, yeah, that's where I got probably the rhythms of the Irish, you know, to come through. And also the, the storytelling, mm -hmm. which you t talk so much about, um, which goes right back to the myth of it all. But without that, you know, then we're focusing an awful lot on the material world and not on story and experience. Mm -hmm. The red wheelbarrow. 
I think one of the hallmarks of your poetry for me is that I, I'll find uh, a whole poem turning on one word, and yeah. that somehow you've made that one word take on multiple tasks or uh, a depth that, that I never understood. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk to us about what you meant when you titled your book, Nevertheless. <laughs> 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 I had a friend write to me recently, an old poet friend, who um, was living in an abyss. He doesn't have the poetry community that, that you do. And uh, <clears throat> we've had a writing relationship for maybe 20 years. Mm. And he, he had bought my book when it first came out and had been out for a couple of years. And he wrote to me out of nowhere. He said, I finally have the word nevertheless figured out. <laughs> 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 I kind of like to leave any kind of interpretation like that. I would never say to him that what he described then afterwards was beautiful. Um, but I would never say to him, that's not what I had in mind. Um, because I did have that in mind if that's what came forth for him. So I wonder, I mean, it seems to me as if it's only kind of recently that you've been getting, I mean recently in the last few years, mm -hmm. that you've been gaining more and more and more attention, I mean, even on a national level. So now you're in more and more national magazines. Your book was finalist for Colorado Book Award. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there's, like, that, does that change things for you? How does that feel? I know you're probably squirming that I even brought it up. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. Um, I think I go along with this idea that um, a poem is incomplete uh, without a reader. Um, so we are under some obligation to get the poems out there, whether it's on stage, or whether we pass them on to our children, or whether we write poems and publish them. Um, I can do the stage, but I'm not as, I don't love it. Um, I write for the quietude of the person who's up all night and can't sleep. <laughs> that's who I'm trying to reach. Because that was me. <laughs> Um, so that's how I, you know, allow myself to go uh, out into that world. But it's very secondary to the writing. I mean, the writing and the poem itself, I'm not thinking about publishing or anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, but some cool things have really come from it. I mean, I, it's been um, really enlightening to read reviews of your own work. It's been really cool to get letters from people from all over the place who say, you know, this poem did this for me, or, you know, mm -hmm. thank you for that. There are, there, there are those lovely things, but you can get really caught up in it and try to just continue it, you know, so I have to take long breaks. Which seems to me you do. It seems to I me do. you're like a, you're pretty you I keep reluctant it. to go into the limelight Yeah, in general. I don't go to the conferences and things like that. And I, I, it's not that I am judging that world of conferences. I don't have a problem with academia. I mean, we require that. They help keep poetry alive, too. They're guardians, mm -hmm. too. Um, but I'm just not comfortable with that. I prefer a festival to a conference. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people have trouble translating uh, their poetry into performance, uh, going from uh, lyric into story, and, and then trying to elicit uh, an audience to understand sort of where they've gone. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit, because I know when we first tried to get you to read your poetry, you were very resistant and uh, not comfortable. And I've watched you get more and more comfortable, and even use dialect and things that are kind of tricky. And so maybe you talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a hard thing for people. Well, I think it has to do... Um, I, I think it has to do with a, um, a basic privacy to my nature. I mean, I really do... I can be very much the life of the party and, you know, the lampshade and all of that. Um, but I tend to be pretty private. So there's a really interesting irony there that people who tend to be private are writing their most innermost, you know, thoughts and concerns and sorrows and joys and, and sharing them with the world. Um, and I do love all of you. But if it weren't for loving all of you, I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Um, well, I think that might be a good segue into hearing some of your work, except maybe just say one or two things about the new book coming out. Well, it's, it's in, um, <laughs> uh, I'm kind of trapped between the children's book and the adult book. <laughs> the children's book has been really scary to write, because you go in the really scary areas. Um, 
um, when you go into that child voice and into that child smallness and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So I began to feel like Yeats, who had real reservations about some of his more political poems that were calling for action, mm -hmm. and people were killed, you know, things like that. He started to feel responsible for his language. Um, and I feel that way about the children's poems. What if some of these darker poems were to get into the hands of the child who was feeling that they could go either way? Yeah. Um, so I got scared. And, um, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to really pull it off. Um, it may take me another 10 years. I thought it would happen as my kids came of age. Um, but the poems did get dark. They were full of light and laugh, but they got darker than my usual dark would go, which is can go pretty dark. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, if I don't do that, if I continue the other route, um, then what I'll have is a book of um, that continues, nevertheless. It'll be a kind of a continuation of that, mm -hmm. of what started there. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I know you give workshops about your artwork, which is stunning and, and I'm very impressive. Do you do writing workshops too? I do. Again, I tend to um, not do a lot, um, but I love that energy. I know I love um, uh, I love inspiring, you know, people. Um, but I do have to go back to the studio. And be <laughs> quiet again. <laughs> yeah, we get overwhelmed. I think we do. I mean, I think we have overload, sensory overload. Um, there's so much information coming in all of the time that if we don't take the time for poetry or art or whatever the thing is that our passion is, then we'll just, we'll get sunk under it. And do you find time to write with the family? Is that, is that hard to do? Do you, it's do you have to carve time out? I, yeah, but I'm lucky, I think. They're all here. I'm Laughter. I've got to like that. <laughs> Hey kid, we got a poem for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's really dark. <laughs> it's really dark. What was the question? Just, uh, 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 I've forgotten. <laughs> oh, family. balancing family and. Oh yeah, balancing. Yeah. When you when do you get time to write? It was you... harder when the kids were little. Yeah. Um, when my kids were Rosemary's age, I, right. I could have screamed um, because you just well she has it figured out. She did, makes sure that she writes every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and her children know that. They probably know this is mommy's time, and they just mm -hmm. notice they really... And they I go to bed. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. They go to bed Sleep, and then... Sleep, thank you. Yes, and help, being a night owl helps. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just, that's just the stuff right there. Be a night owl. Yeah. There's something really nice about everybody being asleep in your house and feeling so safe. And the neighborhood is asleep, and the town is asleep, and you're up, curled up, reading or writing. Which, what's the best book of poetry you've just read in the last month or two? Oh my gosh. I just reread um, a Scottish poet, um, Don Patterson. Mm. Um, and the book was called The White Lie. Mm. Yeah. Nice. Never heard of it. <laughs> Is it D A W N or D O N? D O N, P A T E R S O N. He's a musician too. Uh -huh. um, and so his stuff is really musical. and. Um, don't really know how to describe it. Um, it. It's painfully honest. That's really what I'm looking for now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not interested in um, chaos anymore. I'm interested in wonder and wisdom. Uh -huh. And um, and uh, he's struggling through there, like the rest of us, but doing it in a really honest, honest way. I think honesty is kind of, we've become a little bit too enamored with cleverness and irony. Right. That seems to be a real American trait. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and British. And British. Yeah. You see a lot of when you read world poetry where people sometimes their craft is, is maybe not as polished, but their mm -hmm. the presence yeah, yeah, is so yeah, strong. Right. Yeah. yeah. Honesty is a big one. I just read a quote from Steinbeck where he says, um, the discipline of the written word punishes dishonesty. <laughs> <laughs> because the word will let you write dishonestly, but it's gonna show. It's gonna reveal itself to you. You're gonna know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Neat. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing some poetry tonight, oh, aren't yeah, you, me Rosemary? Too. Yeah, me oh. too. I'm going to say to everybody who's here, I brought these river rocks, so that there's a word tonight that feels like you want to take it out into the world. There's some Sharpies, and you can write your word on the rock, and then, like, you know, keep it in your pocket or give it to someone else or, 
you know, like leave it somewhere on the street <laughs> <laughs> for someone to find. <laughs> so um, maybe listening for a word or two to. Should we pass them out? Or people could maybe come up or and you can just come and get your own. One. Oh, God. Okay. Come take one now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Come take a word. Come take a word. We'll move out of the way. Let and we'll we'll give the word. stage over come to Wendy. Take yes. a word. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, this is actually the blank space. <laughs> the possibility for a word. The possibility is all of the word. If they get their wrong. So, uh, just to say what will happen. I've been telling everybody that, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, we yeah. should have two rocks and smash them together. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> this is Baudelaire. <clears throat> the favors of the moon. The moon, who is caprice itself, looked through the window while you were sleeping in your cradle and said to herself, I like this child. Mm -hmm. And softly, she descended her staircase of clouds and noiselessly passed through the window panes. And then she stretched herself out over you with the supple tenderness of a mother and laid down her colors on your face. And ever since, your pupils have remained green and your cheeks unusually pale. It was while contemplating this visitor that your eyes became so strangely enlarged and she clasped your neck so tenderly that you have retained forever the desire to weep. However, in the expansion of her joy, the moon filled the whole room like a phosphorescent vapor, like a luminous poison, like a luminous poison that went through all living things and said, you shall suffer forever the influence of my kiss. Mm -hmm. You shall be beautiful in my fashion. You shall love that which I love, and that which loves me, water, clouds, silence, the multiform streams, the formless things, the place where you shall not be, the lover whom you shall not know, flowers of monstrous shape, perfumes that cause delirium, cats that shudder, swoon, and curl up on pianos and groan like women with a voice that is hoarse and gentle. And you shall be loved by my lovers, courted by my courtiers. You shall be the queen of all men that have green eyes, whose necks also I have clasped in my nocturnal caresses of those who love the sea, the sea that is immense, tumultuous, and green the formless and multiform streams, the places where they are not, the women whom they do not know. These things that resemble the censors of a strange religion, perfumes that confound the will, and the savage and voluptuous animals, which are the emblems of their dementia. Mm. I like your stone, it's very nice. Mm. All right. That's uh, I've been feeling uh, the pull of the moon all over the, all over my body, mm -hmm. all over myself. Mm -hmm.
Um, I'd like to go from that to something that's a little irreverent, if I may. You may. Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, be irreverent with me. I think that I shall never fear a brontosaurus that is queer. <laughs> Iguanodon as fetishier, a mammoth bringing up the rear, an astrodon with extra gear, metrosexual squirrel and deer, a breeder with a dance career, a fruit with cauliflower ear, a lesbianic chanticleer, a grinning limpish wristed leer, the weird one or the mutineer. But those who perfectly adhere, stay clear, stay clear, stay clear. <laughs> What's the going rate for a poem these days? Merchant culture. I'll trade you a drop of snow for a lyrical poem, a parking lot for a river stone, a soldier's heart for a kettle of gold. I have that. <laughs> I have that same. <laughs> I'll trade you a drop of snow for a lyrical poem, a parking lot for a river stone, a soldier's heart for a kettle of gold the justice card for the nine of swords, a kindly thought for a coming storm, a Russian word for an off chord, a thousand tears, a thousand tomes, and a drop of snow for a lyrical poem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody have a, a quote or a line of poetry that they've got spinning around in their head lately? Ultimately, the air is bare of sunlight, where must be found the lyric balance. Awesome. No. Close. Opposite. Opposite. I knew there was a no. There's an O there. <laughs> Ultimately, the air. The air is bare of sunlight. Is bare of sunlight. Where must be found. Where must be found the lyric valuables. Hmm. All right. I'll try to follow that. I dedicate these words to all the beautiful lovers whose gentle fingers turned to claw at one another. Mm -hmm. I have left these notes for the ordinary Joe who forked the other road and still became his father. I have sung for the woman stubborn as a pile of bricks who in her zeal to live has forgotten to forgive. I am sister to those half broken and half whole, given to the mead, sweating in the sheets or raking in the leaves of joyousness and sorrow. I am counting on those for whom the bell tolls, who settled near the river, having failed to walk on water. <laughs> um, anybody else have another quote? Or? No, no, it's, um, I think it's a thief or or Rumi, it's but uh, but it's where the sun doesn't grumble about shining, but w w without our w w without us and, and us and without with us saying thank you patiently. Yeah, it's it's it's, 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 it's um, not once has the sun said to the moon, "You owe me." Yeah. Look what happens with a love like that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the whole world. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> Here, Wendy, here's one for your, um, for it's responding to Baudelaire mm -hmm. um, about that kissing in the moon part. Mm -hmm. And this, this is for me. It says, I stumbled on my way to the kiss. That's how drunk I was. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I still managed to connect with the most vulnerable part of her. The moon happened to conceive 
what a wild looking baby we're going to have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my, what does that make me want to read? <laughs> All right. Do not dismiss the many gifts in cliff and loan and fellowship, the endless shifts, the unadorned, the bottom line, that little bit of wiggling required to bring the little tingle up the spine. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes we have to get a little drunk. I mean, that's Baudelaire, too, who said, you must get drunk, whether on liquor or poetry or love. You must be drunk. So you got to stumble into the kiss sometimes. Anybody else have a, a line of poetry? Or it doesn't have to be poetry. The woman with a tumor in her neck has a moth in her palm, a river on her tongue, a scalpel in her boat, a lump in her throat, a gamble in her shoe, a fire in her den, a shadow in her flesh, a flutter in her breast, like everybody else. <laughs> Starving spirits, Bring your toys in. Mm -hmm. The three mortal poisons, the seven mighty turrets, and bold Lucia's nine cups are riding on the dusk. Do not ask who cast the first stone. As knowledge comes by way of ghost, so time is wan and taken. Do not fear wandering naked. The hierophant blows his nose, intones, the dusk is cool and eloquent. Fade to black, amoeba on the ocean floor and in the petri dish. Long and soon, obey the orders of the moon. Mm. Thus spoke the voice of wands, the orchid, and the mule. I bow to the divine in you, yawns the early afternoon, croaks the ghost of history. Can you hear the drop of a bead? You who are not yet brothers? Forsake wonder, brave Lucia, Magna Mater, Brash Jabura, who be these empresses, Enochians, Druids, and Scythians, who insist the legends are in us? Night falls. Someone calls the starving spirits to come and eat, to clean their slates, to finish, finish. Myths of Innocence. Do you have a quote for me? I saw you digging around. I have one that I wrote down for when I was reading a book that I liked a lot. As witnesses to your life diminish, there is less corroboration and therefore less certainty as to what you are or might have been. Mm. Wow. Less corroboration, fewer witnesses. It was uh, speaking about aging. Yes. You get to a certain <laughs> I age. I got that. <laughs> <laughs> you get to a certain age and you lose your, um, your people your that peeps. can co corroborate who you are so yeah. you can be anyone you want. <laughs> <laughs> I think, too, there's less desire to prove something, mm -hmm. perhaps. Make some of us dangerous. We've got nothing to prove and nothing to lose. Right. Uh -oh. <laughs> yes. So going off of that idea, a poem entitled The Nature of This. The summer is coming to a close. The river where we panned for gold will soon be strewn with fallen leaves. The sago lily and the rose have quieted. Today it seems that all the world is gentling. We have let go of clutching things. 
Here we watch the seasons come and go with a surprising ease. It isn't that we've bested fear or that we never wake to know in spite of love we die alone. It is enough to fall in love, to fall in love and watch the world unfold. Some sounds I couldn't do without. Thunder, kindling, butter sizzling, water bringing, stones skimming, sprung rhythms, hymn whistling, old doors on porches creaking, trains in a dusky distance, soft rain and coffee dripping, hawks scream, death shifting, laughter's candor, birds in bitter oleander, late Dylan, kettles filling, humans giving, someone scribbling, silence, intuition. What is the sound of intuition? <laughs> That's a question that never hit me before reading that. It's one you can't do without. Yeah. It's it, it's it's definitely it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely deaf enough you have to plug your ears, but it's quiet enough you have to. Yeah. Nice. I like that he had to explain that with his body, because yeah. you can't <laughs> say that in words. Haiku for my daughter. Child, may you know the wholly difficult slope and begonias. Mm -hmm. Domestic poem in autumn. Let us vow that through the winter we shall pause by the river. We shall nestle by the fire and read to one another. We shall come to bear the weather as the leaves believe September, as the body knows surrender, as the sparrow wears her feather. Intersection. Where tedium and suddenness intersect, take a left. <laughs> Should the soft hem of a woman's dress and the river's heartless sluicing fuse undress. Where dreams are few, will the ceiling blue. Deeply blessed or bereft, assume the worst where endless talk and wisdom loom. Say nothing cheap of magnitude or youth, that planet strewn with the guided dumb and the guided dead. Eschew this. Journey true toward your gratitudes and private ends. Don't ask directions of me, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. <clears throat> A mark of age. The hunger has gone. The thirst remains. <laughs> I have a quote for you. Oh, goody. I have walked over the mountain today to visit you, but your cabin is empty. I linger listening to the creek, watching two white butterflies dance above the water. Is that you? No, it's a, an Aspen po a poet that died in 1973 at 31 years of age. Oh, um, my. What's the name? Uh, Robert Thomas Markham, and from oh. a book that was put together after his death called The Song of Larkspur Mountain. Oh, I think so. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. And I've seen that book in the bookstore. It's star. a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is it called, Dave? I love that you the invoked him. Um, I guess I was supposed to. Yes, you were. Uh, it was uh, about Lenado, which is up above Woody Creek in the Roy Fork Valley. That's Larkspur Mountain. Uh, toward, uh, is, is, is that toward is that toward in, in Independence Pass? It's the valley that Independence Pass presides over. Uh, 
Vanity Flare, <coughs> talking about publishing. There's a lot of vanity in it, too. I didn't use the word until now. Don't get me wrong. I know that knowledge is power, that mystery is water, that hunger makes a gargantuan lover. And yes, I've drunk of the river lathe, from the book of the Celts, from the echo of the bugling elk. And yet, alas, here I be, small and twee, all liquored up on song and love, hard as rails and light as air, expecting the heavens to throw down a flare, to send in the clowns, to burn a bush, strike up the sea, anything that might mean those cloudy bastards have noticed me. <laughs> <laughs> How long do we go? Longer. A little longer. <laughs> oh yeah, I'd do a couple more. I can uh, see. Do you uh, do you uh, do you have any, do you have anything about about wonder? Ah, uh, mm. I wrote a poem about three sisters: wonder, wisdom, and woe. <laughs> and I can read that. <clears throat> They're called the Wildwood Sisters. Mm. And they have an interesting relationship with each other. Wonder, wisdom, and woe. For the first one is wonder. <laughs> Wide-eyed she'll find you every time. <laughs> she will not steal your heart or your soul. She will not say, away from here, the sea rocks gently in its bowl. The moon's the ghost of Gilgamesh, floating toward the silver pine. The love you lost is dwelling with the peregrine and the golden eye. And by the by, deep in your chest, a well exists. She won't say that. She is too busy changing form. A hand upon your shoulder lifts. She will not take your world by storm. <laughs> That's wonder. <laughs> the second sister is wisdom. It said she knows what laughter is, where peaceful goes, what deaf can hear, how blindness shows, what draws us near, what bids <coughs> us move, what holds the heart, and what the heart is fashioned of, and what men choose in lieu of love. All this I see you can believe. It said that deep compassion is the wine she drinks with pinion seed and wild aster. You don't believe. Go and ask her. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> no black sheep, she. This is the third sister. No black sheep, she. She has her place. Her streaming tears and somber face, no stranger to these wild woods to wonder's gown and wisdom's hood. A mighty oak stands near a brook, and in the brook are tender reeds. An arduous and slender breeze told this story to the trees. Three sisters gathered in the column, for woe had opened up her palm, and something white had lighted there. A moment passed, a presence felt, and as the calm began to melt, she spoke the words that bent her fate. You starry fools, melancholy does not end. You've only learned how to pretend. There was no sound, no stifled cough. Sweet wonder turned into a moth. And wisdom, loving of the young, observed the breeze and held her tongue. <laughs> 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 All right, I'll do a couple more. My husband and I are facing what they call the empty nest. Mm -hmm. um, I've written a poem recently about it, but I've been revisiting this old one that I wrote when the kids were like this. And it's called The Time of Just Before. Just over the sink, between the curtains, clouds peel off the mountain tops and careless sail away. I crane my neck and stay. Closer in, a show of snow, a sprinkling, an aspen sapling, 
crows. It is the time of just before. Down the hall and past the study lies a whole nother continent, a boy and girl asleep, surrendered to their dreams. Polar bears and golden pears, Rapunzel in a chair. It is the time of just before the stars have blinked to finalize their lion's paws, just before the moon is sure to overwhelm it all, just before the winter breaks its harsh transcendent breath. It is the time of just before the circular sound of a key in the door, the corresponding tiredness, the words we save all day to say, the scent of home. Tonight, I'll speak of whitened crows, a thin, insistent show of snow, powdered sugar, sleet, reams and reams of dreams. <laughs> no. <laughs> My little girl just texted me this morning out of nowhere. I just saw her two days ago. She was sick. She's out of nowhere. I miss you. Oh. <laughs> She's got her own place. She's teaching now. All right, one more. Monty across the street believes she's traveling in a great train and traveling far. Tonight she dines in the dining car. The meat is sweet, but the soup is thick and tastes a little bit like tar. All the same, you come too, she softly croons, patting my hand, while through the glass her, her gaze remains on the changing plains, the clearing rain, the stars, the stars, the stars. Thank you all so much. So we'll take a little break and then now we're going to rearrange the chairs and come up there.